How many people in this room think AI is a good uh, to apply to healthcare? Okay, congratulations, you found your way to the right room. Uh, my name is Alex Irmalaev. Uh, so actually, I got my original degree in AI a um, very long time ago, more than 20 years ago. And I did get a chance to do a few projects over the years. Um, some of the projects were at uh, actually expert systems at Bell Labs and several startup projects. Um, and for the last five years, I'm working on AI full time. So let me uh, introduce the company. So Change Healthcare is one of the largest healthcare technology companies uh, in the world. The company came together through a lot of acquisitions. Uh, many of the companies um, were merged together, and that's uh, MDON and Relay Health, Altegra, Change Healthcare, WebMD, McKesson Technology Services. Uh, so we're about 15,000 employees. We manage about 20% of medical imaging in the United States. Uh, about 60% of medical claims go through our networks. And finally, one in three electronic health records, or patient records. Uh, since the company, so we're basically a huge healthcare data processing company. And the third was, uh, if, uh, since uh, AI is so data intensive, and since this is the company that has more data than anybody else, uh, this company should be in a good position to succeed with AI and healthcare. Um, we don't have all the data, so don't assume that everything is available, uh, but we have more than other companies uh, in, in the place. So now we are moving from the information age to the AI age or intelligence age. And uh, uh, I kind of like to kind of remind people why this whole thing is, is a big deal. Um, every time, so the prosperity we have is driven by a very specific set of inventions or transitions. Uh, each of them took about 55 years. Uh, every time, every transition starts with a basic innovation, followed by mass production of this innovation, and followed by the structuring of the society around the innovation. So for the last couple of waves, the basic innovation was internal combustion engine and semiconductor circuit. That's the very basic innovations that you know, required to drive the rest of the, of the uh, evolution. It was followed by mass production, mass production of cars, and mass production of uh, computers. And then the second half of the wave was actually destruction society around this innovation. So building out suburbs, that's the effect of an you know, internal combustion engine. Or building out in the internet, it's the effect of the semiconductor circuit you know, 40 years ago or you know, 20 years earlier. And uh, so with uh, AI, we're kind of going through the same transition. We're starting with the very basic algorithms, right? Just learning to do the basic, how it works, what does it do. Uh, and then, um, so it's kind of dominated a little bit by researchers right now. So the next step, and that probably will take us a few more years, then we'll move to the mass production of AI algorithms for every possible needs, and then restructuring of society around AI. And for healthcare, I have several examples how restructuring of the society around AI is actually more impactful than the original technology itself. Um, so uh, we already know that AI was able to demonstrate very significant performance in the last two years. Um, the algorithms have been improving for a long time. AI is obviously new, not new. Uh, so every time you try to find who was the first, you always find somebody in the 50s or 60s. That's pretty much when a lot of the ideas were generated. But um, in most cases, it was just papers, never been realized into any kind of technology. People wrote papers, and other people read it or not. But uh, it went nowhere because there was no data, and there was no computing power to do it. Uh, very few uh, AI applications succeeded over the years, and there were some successful ones. Um, control system for energy machinery, like nuclear power stations. It's a feedback loop AI type you know, circuitry there. Uh, expert systems, in a few cases, succeeded. Um, search, search is an AI algorithm, it's a learning algorithm. Uh, but um, in most cases, the accuracy was limited. So the use cases you can place AI or apply AI to always been limited. Um, so in the last few years, we had a very major innovation. Uh, in 2012, Alex Krzyzewski, Ilya Sotskever, I wrote a paper, um, ImageNet paper about ImageNet. 
and we have a massive improvements in accuracy. So this particular chart is for the Microsoft speech recognition accuracy, but you can get pretty much the same picture in many other domains. The same for images, the same for you know, speech to text, and et cetera. So uh, what happens is obviously deep learning. It's a technology which was actually not new either. So I was trying to figure out what, when the way deep learning was invented, and it looks like it was 1965, and it used to be group methods of data handling. Uh, but there was no computing machinery. There was no data to do it. So it never went anywhere until 2000. Well, actually, there were some um, applications of neural nets in the 90s, but uh, the major uh, innovation, the major breakthrough uh, came after 2012. But so as a result, what happens is we do have a tools. We do have a technique to achieve very high accuracy if it's warranted, right? Very high accuracy requires tons of data, requires tons of compute. Most, um, most use cases don't have the data, don't have the compute, and don't have the need to have this type of accuracy. But if we do need to have the high ac accuracy, we do have a way to get there. And that's a very big deal, because what it means is, instead of applying AI to few corner cases, we can actually find much broader areas of applicability for AI. However, AI adoption is very early stages, as we talked about. So this is statistics I forwarded from our friends for MBA, MBM. Um, so they say 94% of the companies believe AI is the future. So that's based on the uh, survey of CEOs. So the CEOs are all convinced. Would you mind uh, posting the slides up on our video, please? Yes, I will post the slides so you guys don't have to take pictures. So majority of the CEOs already agree that AI is the future and they're all making investments, but how many companies actually able to make a difference? Actually, much fewer. Uh, takes a while to build a team. Build, takes a while to understand what the data is, what you need to do with labeling, and all those kind of things. So uh, we're very early stages, and that's okay. But we have a long way to go. So why e apply AI to healthcare? The first one is uh, healthcare is number one industry in the United States. Three point seven billion. Um, $3.7 trillion industry. Uh, it's growing 5% per year. So it's growing actually much faster than the United States is. It's projected to reach 5.3 5 trillion by 2025, which might bankrupt this country. But um, so it's the number, largest number uh, industry by revenue, by headcount, by growth rate, by everything. It's right now, it's number two in research and development budget. In two years, healthcare will be number one in research and development budget. Healthcare, um, I try to include everything related, so it's usually healthcare and life sciences. The question was, uh, how do you deal with highly regulated industry? Healthcare is highly regulated. It's actually a little bit worse, because first, it's highly regulated. Second, it does not protect IP in the way we are used in technology industry. So the information broadly shared. So if you are sharing your best findings, um, how do you make money? In terms of regulation, it's, you know, if you facing with a certain set of laws, you have to abide the law or you go to prison. Um, the level of regulation is somewhat high, but I think um, um, well, I'll get a chance to get it in, this, in the later slides. Um, there are spec very specific uh, regulations around data and how data can be shared and not shared which is usually a big, uh, big impediment to implementing AI in healthcare. So uh, number two in research and development budget is going to be number one in two years. So if you want to find a good job, which is growing, you know, healthcare is the place. It actually has number one in terms of AI opportunities. It's also number one in terms of AI startups, and most people don't realize it, but the largest number of VC found that AI startups are in healthcare. And I have a slide on that uh, later in the deck as well. And finally, well, it, um, healthcare is a way to save lives. So what are the major applications of AI in healthcare? Um, there are a lot of different areas, and healthcare is a big space, so I try to structure it in something a little bit more compact and logical, so it's kind of easier to follow. There are three basic areas. One is diagnostics or medical intelligence. And the second one is personalization or treatment uh, plans. 
and finally optimizing the United States healthcare system. All three are very important. The first one is a diagnostic. So there are three different areas within diagnostic space. Uh, early diagnosis, uh, health monitoring devices, medical devices industry, uh, to answer your questions, what's included here. And finally, medical imaging. Medical imaging is also an industry in its own right. So let's look uh, first at um, early diagnosis. Uh, the poster child for AI is sepsis. So you guys know what sepsis is? Not many people, but some people know. So, uh, so in, let's say infection enters your body because you ride a bike and hit a wall or something happens or you uh, went through the surgery. So infection takes, you know, enters your body, takes hold. Your body releases a bunch of chemicals to kill the infections. And sometimes the amount of chemicals released is so high that it kills you. So your organs start failing. Um, and um, this disease has very rapid onset. Uh, many people will die within a few days. Your probability of survival decreases about 7% per hour uh, once you hit the, the, person, uh, the stage of severe shock. Uh, sepsis is number one disease for uh, hospital cost, in terms of hospital costs. Uh, many people don't realize, but the like, cancer or the heart attacks are actually, you spend some, a small amount of time in a, in a hospital and then you're released and you're outpatient. Um, sepsis, you stay in the hospital for the duration of the treatment uh, when they administer all the antibiotics and other treatments. So sepsis is very hard to diagnose because um, the indication of sepsis are what's called nonspecific. So your heart rate goes up a little bit, just a little bit. Or your breathing goes up a little bit. So how do you know if it's sepsis or Let's say if you go on stage, most people have a heart rate goes up, right? Maybe I have sepsis right now, right? Um, or you go down the hall, your heart rate goes up, right? So how do you know what sepsis and what is just a normal, you know, normal condition? Um, hospital try to apply traditional techniques, traditional programming tools. Every hospital, every CEO has a dashboard which things are like flushing, which hospital has what sepsis patient alerts, whatever. Um, it doesn't work. First of all, when you write things precisely in a traditional programming way, you have to specify your rules in a traditional way, right? It's like if your heart rate goes so high, then raise an alert. Well, sometimes you miss the onset of sepsis altogether, and sometimes you raise the alert too soon, and healthcare professionals don't trust the system anymore, and your whole you know, effort is wasted. So this is a great place where AI can make a tremendous progress because um, well-developed and well-trained um, AI model are much more nuanced and can capture sepsis and separate sepsis from a more traditional, you know, going down the hole and stuff like that. Um, and so the sepsis is one of the most promising uh, areas where AI can be implemented. So in this particular, uh, Papers that show that they can reduce, predict this, uh, detect the sepsis about eight hours earlier. So for adults, it's about eight hours earlier. For children, it's about six hours earlier. Six hours is a big deal because your probability of survival goes by 7% per hour. Uh, so if you're interested in this paper, you can look it up. So this is a, just a very basic example how early diagnostic is happening, right? Um, uh, this is the same type of technology can be applied to many different areas. Uh, in case of kidney failure, you can predict it 60, 90 days ahead of the actual failure, pretty reliable. In case of diabetes, do you know how much earlier you can predict it? About five years. You can obviously detect pre-diabetes condition, but you can detect it five years earlier than uh, using traditional methods. So this is a very typical application of AI, early diagnosis. Um, the challenge, of course, in most cases uh, in the healthcare system is the challenge is not actually writing the algorithms, even though there is a challenge with that. The challenge is to implementing the algorithms within the real healthcare system because it's a very human process. So 
unless somebody does something differently based on the algorithms you wrote, the algorithm is useless. Right. So the challenge in many cases in healthcare system is not the writing algorithms, but finding your way into the actual application. So the second area is medical devices. So on the, on the left, you have a traditional hospital devices, big giant machines which capture your heart rate every few seconds or whatever, right? They have all the information, they cost you know, a few hundred thousand dollars. Um, you can apply AI there. On the right, you have uh, the uh, consumer devices like Apple Watch. Um, Apple Watch can now um, capture some of the conditions like atrial fibrillation. It's one of the first algorithms, AI algorithms many people develop because it's pretty straightforward to develop. Uh, so, and the consumer devices will continue to add more and more functionality like that. Now, the doctors look, think about it as a toy, uh, but in some cases, actually can, can save your life as well. The middle category, I think, is the most interesting. The middle category is the category is actually emerging right now. And it's a special purpose devices. Uh, this picture particularly is for the Medtronics, which is a large uh, device company. It's a, a mobile app for people to manage diabetes. But you have a whole bunch of different mini devices. Many of them are actually made in China for some reason. Uh, so there is a big change, uh, trend in China making those devices, which is special purpose device. Uh, it's usually like, you know, small size something, that not, not, a, not a watch, but some kind of small size device, um, which can uh, track, monitor a very specific condition you have. And for people with that specific condition, uh, it can significantly improve um, the, the quality of life and the duration of life. Um, those devices proliferate like crazy. Um, and they become more and more niche. Um, those devices only capture a few time series, right? From an AI point of view, they're not very rich source of data, but they capture the right time series. So that's kind of very interesting. Um, finally, the medical imaging. Medical imaging is the area which attracted the most attention. Uh, so this particular example is from a recent uh, UCSF study where they, where they were trying to predict Alzheimer. And they figured out they can do it about six years earlier than it was done before. You can look up a paper, it's, uh, it's uh, available online. Uh, there was another similar study done on breast cancer a few months ago. I don't know if you guys saw it in TechCrunch. Uh, so they can predict uh, breast cancer about five years earlier. Of course, five years earlier, not you're predicting, right? So you, the cancer is not developed yet. So what they're, say, what they're saying is they're looking for particular density of tissue and saying that particular density of tissue will be associated, is likely to be associated with breast cancer uh, five years from now. So a very, very interesting approach. The challenge with that is, okay, what do we do about it, right? We have a way to treat cancer when we know there is a cancer, right? There is chemotherapy, there is radiation. But what if we have a you know, high density of tissue which might or might not become a cancer, right? So uh, this is one of those things where AI is one part, but restructuring society or restructuring our healthcare system about those predictions is where the value is going to come. Because if we can predict things accurately, and if the healthcare system is able to deal with that high density tissue rather than the cancer itself, the cancer might never actually happen, but we have to restructure the system and find new treatments uh, for the things which we don't know existed in the past. However, within a medical imaging space, actually there are a lot of challenges. Um, in many cases, people think, well, I'll just develop one algorithm and it will work very well, and I make millions of dollars. Unfortunately, it doesn't work this way. Um, there are some limitations AI have. Um, so some of the limitations is AI can detect only the things it was trained to detect, and it does not see the big picture. Another one, the, the patients don't trust AI as much as they trust doctor. Um, and then AI is very sensitive to resolution of devices. Anyway, so there is a set of limitations which makes it more difficult to say AI will replace doctors. So in fact, is 
AI is not going to replace anybody anytime soon. But what we need to do is to have AI as an assistant to a doctor. So what we need to think about is not AI diagnosing something, even though we have an article about it. It's, um, it's a little bit of stretch. What we need is the AI being in a support position to a doctor, being able to help the doctor to diagnose diseases, treat diseases. So the most interesting thing, you know, applications of AI is actually not diagnosis, but let's say screening. Or you might say, OK, I want you, algorithm, to go through the database and find similar cases to what I'm looking at, which were pri previously misdiagnosed. So that the doctor becomes more, in, in, uh, more um, educated about the particular condition. So don't try to say the AI is going to replace doctors. What we need is to enable doctors to do a better, better job. Um, another challenge with the medical imaging is just the sheer number of different conditions that, um, uh, that can be diagnosed. Uh, this is a high priority for our company, for our medical imaging division. There are 20, con whatever, 20 30 conditions there. Um, Alzheimer's is not even there, right? There are some high volume, high, um, high frequency conditions that need to be uh, done first. So um, dozens of different conditions. Every device is different. Pictures look a little bit different. Resolution, calibration, all those kind of things. Uh, basically, you're looking for like thousands of different algorithms that need to be developed in order to make uh, the whole thing uh, effective. It's coming, but it will just take a little bit of time. Uh, the second area um, where AI is applicable in healthcare is personalization uh, or treatment. Uh, the first one is precision medicine. Uh, many of you already heard about genomics, proteomics, uh, all those kind of things. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a project by National Institute of Health called All of Us. Um, do you know what the number one step? What are they working on right now? Getting the data. You think startups are alone? This is government, right? So in 2015, uh, Obama administration launched a big project, All of Us. We're going to collect data, complete data set for 10 million people. So complete data set means your medical records, complete medical records, right? Because right now, if you go to, if you have a primary uh, care physician, he has history on you. Hospital has a different database. Your this has a third one. Genetic data is all together somewhere else. So even if you are a customer of healthcare system, your data is probably spread over 10 or 20 different systems which don't talk to each other. So uh, this project, which was launched by the government, to collect complete data set on 10 million Americans. The only way to actually get this data is for a person, you, go to all of your healthcare providers, get the data, and then give it to the government. There is no way around it. Um, so they announced that they, so far, so it's been four years, they got data for 100,000 people. So I'm making progress, but very le long way to go. So this is government, and the big first step is just getting the data. And we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, personalized treatment plans. Uh, this particular paper is from somebody at MIT. Uh, they did a project and say, can we improve uh, the chemotherapy and radiation treatment for cancer patients. And um, with an AI, uh, they tried to do several experiments. First, they said, OK, what if my objective is to minimize the size of the tumor as much as possible? Well, if this is your objective, so you, you, what you do is they give the maximum dosage possible that the body can handle. So if you have just one objective, uh, you know, minimize the size of the tumor, uh, your, your uh, AI will recommend the same thing as your doctor will. However, if you give AI multiple objectives, let's say if I want to minimize the size of the tumor, yet to help person live a normal life so people don't, um, life don't become completely miserable, right? So what they find is, if you have multiple objectives, maybe you will skip some dosages. 
maybe you reduce some dosage by 25 or 50 or 75 percent. Because if you have multiple objectives, you will have a different treatment plans. But now, you can only build those treatment plans using AI. You cannot build that by you know, guess, right? You need to have all complete information. You need to watch the person reaction to particular chemicals and make adjustments on the fly. So very promising for people who get a lot of pain from the treatment. <laughs> Um, another final area in this category is clinical trials. So in the United States, drugs are pretty expensive. Uh, the biggest problem with it is actually system failure. So only 3.4% of oncology clinical trials are completed. So those are pe people who are more, you know, the most sick. Uh, other clinical trials are not the bad, but oncology are the worst. Um, most clinical trials don't get completed because people don't stick with them. So people drop off, you don't have enough people, the trial is canceled, you have to restart from all over again. Only 3.4% are completed because most of them cannot hold the people, you know, or cannot find the people, or cannot keep the people within the program. Uh, at the same time, only 5% of the patients enrolled in anything at all. So what you have a big mismatch. Why do we have big mismatch between patient and the need of the drug discovery? because it's a very manual process. So if you are the drug company, what you need to do, you need to contact 200 physicians within your specific area of interest, hoping that each of them will find 1.5 patient because of those, the inclusion, exclusion, and all the conditions that you put on them. So most of the uh, physicians don't have you know, that many patients, so they end up giving only 1.5. And then if 20% of them drop off, then you have to start again. So we have a very kind of narrow, like a bottleneck, that the clinical, the company who trial, runs the clinical trials need to personally know the doctor who needs to personally know the patient. And that becomes a very inefficient system. Uh, the efficient solution, of course, we have all the data in the HR, run algorithm, figure out who fits the trial, and bypass the whole, you know, the whole bottleneck. Um, now, it's actually kind of sounds like an ideal AI problem. It's actually not that easy to do because the drug companies don't have access to the electronic health records. And uh, anyway, so the ownership of data becomes a big, big, big issue. And finally, optimizing uh, healthcare system. There are three areas of smart electronic health records, payment accuracy, and patient identification and retention. So according to government statistics, about one third of healthcare spending is wasted. Uh, so one third of 3.7 billion is one, sorry, of 3.7 trillion is 1.2 trillion dollars is wasted. Uh, this number is for per, per person for US. So unnecessary services, $800 per person per year in the United States. And if you don't go to doctor, you're still paying this $800, right? This is per person for everybody. Every, you know, man, woman, child um, in the United States. The second one that I like, um, billion errors. So we have about $200 billion in billion errors in the United States healthcare system. Now, this is a government statistic. This is not something um, um, that um, we came up with. Um, so there is some fraud and some inflated pricing, but a lot of it is just, you know, just benign and mismanagement and um, inaccuracy within the system itself. So a lot of this can be actually fixed. And actually within AI system, this is actually in many cases the low hanging fruit. Um, as you think about how AI is going to progress, it's not going to happen everywhere at the same time. Um, so what you're looking for is low hanging fruit first, then something in medium term, and then long shot will be, will take a little bit longer. So one of the basic needs uh, for the smart electronic health records is understand medical text. Uh, so right now within the, uh, within the United States health system, healthcare system, we have massive amount of information on everybody, on everyone who is in the system, right? So average patient, average person who uses the healthcare system on a regular basis, um, we have uh, several hundred 
pages of information, about 400 pages per person with a medical history. So every time you stay in the hospital, every time you go to doctor visits, they are not generated. 80% um, of the data is in text, and 20% in, in some kind of coding, in some kind of codes. So 80% of the data was in the text. So unless somebody reads this text, this information is not known to anybody. Now, knowing the complete medical history can actually be extremely helpful. Uh, there was a, a paper which um, uh, just uh, looked for the sign of depression electric, in uh, electronic health records and used this information to help to treat um, HIV patients. So, uh, so what they found is simply by knowing that the patient also has a depression, you will change, change um, course of treatments and you will get better results just by knowing, by having more complete understanding of the patient history. So uh, understanding medical text is extremely important. Um, but um, uh, the challenge, of course, was this is we cannot read this, right? Like if you try to read it, Mrs. Roloff was admitted and underwent thoracentesis. Uh, the pleural fluid revealed metastasis. So I cannot understand what's written, right? But I have to train the computer to understand what's written in this text and to make medical suggestions. So that's the challenge with medical text. Um, a lot of medical text is just needs to be converted in what's called ICD codes, which is diagnostic codes, um, or the treatment codes. Uh, we have diagnostic codes for everything. ICD-10 is the latest system. And uh, in addition to the basic stuff like flu and um, you know, uh, cold, we have uh, ICD-10 codes for all kinds of interesting things like um, bitten by a cow or stuck by a rocker. So uh, we have the coding system, so now what we need to do in many cases, some of the first steps is just to convert um, the medical text into the codes which can be used for either uh, in a managing healthcare system or for improving the uh, patient treatment. Uh, another problem that we worked at our company is medical claims, since we're the largest uh, uh, clearing house for medical claims. Uh, within the United States healthcare system, there is about $3 trillion of medical claims generated every year. About 9% of them get denied. So you send a medical claim, uh, you wait a month, and they tell you you forgot an attachment. And he said, oh, I didn't forget it. You, you, didn't, you didn't find it, whatever. Um, so $262 billion get stuck just in that little um, process. Uh, very much a predictable problem. Um, this is something that we already have a project, and it's working well. So very solvable problem. So small, in, you would think, you know, medical claim billion is insignificant. But if you think about the losses within the healthcare system, there's $100 billion in losses just in that, in that particular area. Uh, another interesting area that we worked uh, last year is dual enrollment. So uh, in the United States, almost 60 million people are Medicare beneficiaries. Uh, about one third of them live with below poverty level, which means 20 million people live below poverty level. Uh, Medicare does not pay for everything pays for majority of expenses, but not everything. Uh, so people who live below poverty level are eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid. Now, if they don't enroll in the right program, what it means for those patients who live below poverty level is that they either have to not to get the medical treatments they need, or they get it and declare bankruptcy, basically. So just getting the right people to the right programs that the government already provides, uh, you, can do, you can help a lot of the people who need the, the help the most. So we talked about in AI in healthcare. So there are three different areas. Diagnostics, which is early diagnosis based on electronic health records, uh, medical devices, uh, trying to extract the patterns from the time series, and medical imaging, which is all you know, CNN, of course, uh, neural networks. 
Then personalization, precision medicine. Precision medicine is the ability to map genetic or, or um, proteinomic or other information to actual conditions. Uh, right now, we can do it in about 4% of the cases. 96% of the cases, we have no idea how to map. A lot of work to do there. Personalized treatment plans for many patients who are in a serious condition or undergo very harmful treatments. Uh, there is a huge amount of work which can be done to uh, make their life a lot easier. Clinical trials is a big area of uh, big area where the system basically failed to work uh, efficiently today. And finally, optimizing the United States healthcare system. Up to a third of the cost can be eliminated uh, if we do things right. Now, if we look at what the startups are doing, the startups are everywhere. So this is a report from uh, CB Insights. Uh, so if you think about whatever you can think about, it's probably on this chart, and this is only 100. So CB Insight has a database about 1,000 startups that are doing stuff in AI. Okay. And it's uh, clinical trials, risk analysis, nutrition, devices, genetics, imaging, like everything we talked about is, is there in one way or another. But there are always challenges. Within healthcare, there are three kind of big challenges. Um, first, like uh, many people in Silicon Valley that come in, like you know, Google or Facebook, you know, get do a lot of AI for things like web ads, right? Web ad is the same; it's shown to the same, the same way to every person, every way. There are billions of them, and it's all pretty straightforward. But in healthcare, you don't have that much of the, like the one huge market. But you have a huge number of smaller markets. So if you de develop an algorithm for Alzheimer stage two, you might need different algorithm for Alzheimer stage three from different cancer is like there are thousands of different cancers. You need the different stages. You need to train algorithms for each of them. So what you need to do is not to achieve highest accuracy for one algorithm. What you need to find a way is to build the algorithms like in a, in a kitchen or convenient build. So you enter the area, and you try to build a whole set of solutions for that particular space. Uh, so you don't reinvent the wheel every time. Um, so we have a lot of variety of applications rather than one thing that uh, solves everything. The second one is data. Data is obviously regulated. If you, don't think, if you do things wrong, you go to prison. Uh, there is personal health information, and um, it's protected by law. There is HIPAA, there is additional. Um, um, laws. Uh, within uh, Europe, you have GDPR. So uh, you have to follow the law. Uh, if you think that somebody will just give you data for free and it's going to be perfect and clean, it's probably not going to happen. Uh, so it's probably going to be you have to find a partner you can work with, and you have to provide a real, part real value to that partner uh, in order to have access to the data without having any ownership of the data or something like that, right? Uh, there are some cases where the data is being made public, mostly for research purposes, but it's a tiny, tiny set um, of what's, what's available out there. So you have to respect the data because uh, there is no way around it. Uh, also try to, sometimes people try to do work with US healthcare data from Europe or vice versa. That's the worst thing you can do because you get both HIPAA and GDPR and it's a nightmare. Try to avoid it um, as much as you can. And finally, you have to understand the workflow. So the fact that you implemented the AI algorithm doesn't make any difference unless it's implemented somewhere. So if your algorithm creates something or predicts something, you need to know exactly who is going to do what in response to that thing. Because uh, many IT projects, many health, you know, technology projects within healthcare systems often fail. Uh, because it doesn't change the behavior, it doesn't change the process. Uh, so you have to figure out how to make your, your work a reality within a system. I already talked about that we're early in technology adoption. Uh, this particular slide is not specific for healthcare system, but it's uh, uh, just uh, one of the slides from op one of the recent OpenAI papers. So what's technically feasible and what's economically viable are two different things. If you have unlimited budget and unlimited compute and unlimited data and unlimited manual effort to fix the labels, 
you can do miracles. In real time, you have a budget constraint, time constraint, compute constraint. Um, so what you need to do is you need to look for that little triangle in the middle, right? So what you need to find is a project which can be technically feasible, technically feasible and economically viable at the same time. Uh, obviously, as we go, uh, as the tools become better, as knowledge becomes more widespread, uh, this area is going to become uh, bigger. But for now, it's very important to choose your projects very carefully. And, um, and finally, one of the last slides I have is within healthcare, trust is very important. Um, we have to do a lot of work uh, to get the patients to trust AI. And it shouldn't be like trust AI in general, because AI is whatever, right? It's not, uh, not a thing. So what you need to show is them is efficacy of your work you're doing. And you need to show that you, you have your best intention and you're doing a good job uh, in order to make it work. So both the trust in the company and the trust in technology at the same time is the challenge for AI and healthcare. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Isn't it easier in countries like UK where they have nationalized healthcare to get all the data in one truck in one place? Yes, the question is do the countries with nationalized healthcare system have all the data in one place? And UK is one of those countries. Indeed, uh, what was it called? Uh, national. Anyway, so there is a the government uh, entity which manage all of the hospitals in the United States. Oh, sorry, in the United K in the United Kingdom, they do run their own AI trials. So because they they have the data, uh, they can mandate which AI trial is going to be run and which AI algorithm is going to be developed. Uh, it's promising. Not everything is comparable to the way United States healthcare system works. So some of the knowledge developed there can be transferred to the United States. Some other stuff is not transferable, unfortunately. So the question is, um, because of the government regulation of fragmentation, would it be more difficult for a startup uh, to build a um, company in healthcare space than it is for established companies? So um, my answer will be like kind of twofold. On one hand, yes, indeed, AI is, uh, right now, in the early stages of AI adoption, larger companies already have a data, have an advantage. We're in Walmart right now, so the companies have an advantage, large companies have an advantage. Um, so this is true that large companies have an advantage during the early stages of uh, technology adoption. However, that's always the case with any technology. So you, AI is not particularly unique in that respect. Large companies have a advantage during the early stages of technology adoption. Uh, but in many cases, this, this advantage is actually not, um, not uh, realized. Uh, so large companies try and sometimes succeed, sometimes don't. And they do end up um, buying a lot of startups. And the second part, if you look at the valuations, we see valuations, how much money VCs put into AI startups. They actually put more money than in normal startups in healthcare. So healthcare startups get, AI healthcare startups get more money than AI startups in general. Uh, because the opportunity is bigger, the inefficiency is bigger, so VCs are putting more money in. However, the success rate tends to be lower than average, so it's easier to raise the money, but it's harder to actually succeed. So that's kind of, that's kind of easy where we are right now. F FDA has actually started a program specific for AI yeah, algorithms, they actually now certify algorithms. And they actually have a pre-certification program. So if the company proven to be doing a good job, they will pre-approve your algorithm ahead of time, which is kind of funky. So um, FDA is kind of a barrier, but they're also innovating. So I don't know if they're actually the biggest barrier. Um, I think the much bigger barrier is data. Uh, or the adoption. The adoption is the biggest barrier. Yes, please. 
So the question was, um, is there some parallels with the adoption of spreadsheets? And yes, I agree absolutely. So right now we're about AIs where the databases were in the 70s. Do you guys know where the databases were in the 70s? It was flat file. And AIs we operate with flat files. So that's kind of very similar. So yes, so we're in early stages. Right now it's more researchy, then it's going to be engineering, and then it's going to be mass production and sales and whatever. Um, but yeah, the, the, the development and adoption technology uh, will, should be very similar to the traditional computing uh, we already saw. Yes. Uh, what is the problem with anonymizing data when they're making them available? So what is the problem with anonymizing data? Um, so yes, you can anonymize data, remove um, names, addresses, etc. It has to be certified by statistician. Uh, so, for example, if you have a one cancer patient in a particular zip code and you removed all his names, but he's the only one, then he's still considered identifiable. Um, so, yes, you can de-identify a certain amount of data. It costs money, a lot of money. Uh, not all the data is de-identifiable. And then the identity actually has all the value because identity is how you match the data from different data sets. If you don't know who that person is, then you only get subset. So yes, uh, some data they identified is available. It's available publicly. You can buy it through brokers, whatever. Um, but it's not the uh, ideal solution in any case. So the question is, if you want to do diagnostics, how do you work with the company who has the data in order to do it? Um, well, I mean, that's not an easy thing. You probably need to have a relationship. You need to find a spot where they have a need, which is not addressed. And the need has to be very severe and dire, so they're willing to do something about it. Um, don't assume that they're going to give you the data. Is are going to sign you a bunch of things in blood. But if you own your own model, uh, you know, that's fine, right? Um, uh, so there is no easy condition, but uh, there are ways to do it. I think in many cases, so what happened in the last few years, a lot of healthcare companies, uh, all the hospitals, big um, hospital systems, they all did AI projects. But most of them are POCs. And sometimes they're pretty nice POCs, like 250K or whatever. So they do POC on something very basic, very standard type of situation. They learn from it. and nothing happens after that, right? So when they, when they do POCs, they often find that, OK, my data is missing. My data is not labeled correctly. You know, computing power is wrong, or maybe my consultant is wrong, or my subcontractor is wrong. So sometimes you just have to be flexible and kind of continue to work with different companies. Um, because if you find somebody, it doesn't mean that you will be able to stay with that person until, uh, until the project is successful. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Good question. Yeah, I think it's a one-off, uh, and it's uh, building relationships and working for solving people's needs. That's very dire for them. Yes, please. The question is, what's the acceptable uh, accuracy rates uh, for the AI in healthcare? So uh, all of the papers that I was mentioning today, uh, they all have like 92, 95 type 98 type range. Uh, so if you don't have 90s, you don't publish a paper at all. Now, in real life, it's not enough. It usually have to be higher than human accuracy. Uh, the human accuracy actually varies dramatically. There are some uh, areas of medical imaging where the human experts are doing an awesome job. And actually, beating them is quite hard. And there are some areas where it doesn't work very well, so it's actually easy. Uh, so I think uh, so. The next so uh, the next barrier is to be better than human. Uh, but even if you're better than human, sometimes it's not good enough. Because if you say, "Oh, I'm as good as a doctor," then why should I use your AI algorithms? So you have to do is significantly better by a significant margin, or do it earlier. So a lot of papers I was showing is, you know, if you can predict sepsis six hours earlier with 7% uh, probability of death per hour, that's 40% uh, survival rate. That's a big deal. Uh, if you can show uh, detect breast cancer five years earlier, that's a big deal. 
Alzheimer's six years earlier, that's a big deal. So sometimes you don't um, go accuracy versus accuracy, sometimes you look for additional benefits of your technology. Do we have a program for understanding medical terms? Um, we don't. Um, and it's actually a big problem because every time you, people, new people come to healthcare system, um, most things don't make sense. Um, so I think the only way to do is get into it and start working with it. Um, even for engineers we already have, it takes very long time to figure out what's going on because you know your piece of code but you have no idea who is using it for what reason. Uh, so that's definitely a big problem. Um, but, uh, but there are different ways to get into the healthcare system. Um, so did I answer your question? Thank you. If you look what people are doing today, let's say if you look for the drug companies, right? It's like, okay, what do the drug companies do with AI? In theory, you would say, oh, they are going to discover new drugs using AI. Well, maybe sometimes. It's like, okay, if they're not doing drug discovery, maybe at least they're doing clinical trials. Well, not quite. They're doing a lot of commercialization. So a lot of AI is applied today to commercial applications to improve sales and marketing. Uh, so a lot of the early, like, low-hanging fruits are optimizing the system the way the system works. The same cases in healthcare. Um, so uh, PwC, PricewaterhouseCooper, they did their report on AI. They forecast, like, it's create like $15 trillion of value within the next 10 years or something like that. Uh, the interesting part of that report is actually not the numbers because numbers are kind of the same everywhere. The interesting part is they separated the opportunity into ready to go, medium term, and long term. And if you want, you just look it up this report, uh, PwC, AI forecast, something like that. Um, and for the healthcare, they say for ready to go is Insurance and scheduling, something like that. And medium term is like um, human assisted diagnostics or something like that. And like robot doctors is a long term. Uh, so sometimes you can work on the short term problems if you are kind of commercially oriented person, or you can work on the medium term pro projects. Probably long term is probably not, not the right place to work on because you will never see your results. How do we deal with bias um, in algorithms? Well, actually, the bias already exists within the healthcare system. And uh, once you start working with the data, you find things that you did not expect. Uh, so by implementing AI, we have an opportunity to fix those things. And uh, you, can exp you, can, you, know, you can write things to adjust for it. Yes, you can make the, the algorithms less biased than the human bias, yes. Okay, thank you.